Under the lights in Saudi Arabia, no one could stop Sergio Perez, not even Max Verstappen. The drama, though, for this race was after the chequered flag. Alonso was on the podium, then he was off the podium, then he was on the podium again. Was the right decision reached? This is the Sky Sports F1 podcast. Hello all, I hope you're well. Welcome to this week's podcast where I'm joined by David Croft, fresh off the flight. Hello. From London Hi. Heathrow to Sky Studios and Natalie Pinkham. Hello. Hello, hello. You're looking very fresh, Crofty. I, I think on a scale of one to ten, um, I'm not doing too bad for a 75-year-old man. Um, <laughs> just, Is that how you feel? I do feel a little bit like that. <laughs> I, it's, it's weird. I, I'm very good at sleeping, but I didn't sleep a lot last night at all. There was a lot of noise on the plane. Uh, Bernadette Collins, travel with Bernadette Collins anytime. She just keeps herself to herself, no noise whatsoever. Simon Lazenby, you know, slightly different. Um, <laughs> a snoring Simon Lazenby? He does sometimes. Does he? Uh, not does last he? night, but he does occasionally. Um, rather loud child, about three yeah. rows uh, behind me. Um, and two people having a conversation at a level where it kept me awake, but I couldn't quite decipher all the words that were being said, but they were kind of, shouting at each so other across like the aisle. So you're kind of like either speak up or down, but not at that level, because that's really annoying. Yeah, it was like, yeah. speak up a bit and I'll join in. Keep it a bit quiet and I'll go back to sleep again. Uh, but don't keep it as it is. But you know what, Matt? I, it doesn't matter how little sleep I got. <laughs> the mere fact that you also travelled back. Well, yes, Saudi last I didn't night, want to mention it. You, you know, know, I didn't want to mention it. And look it. ten times better than I do. <laughs> and Pinkham had the weekend off. You know, it makes me feel even better. You've had more sleep than both of us put together. Which makes a nice last change. Night. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day yeah. for Thank yesterday. You. Yeah. Thank you. Did yeah. you did you watch the race? Absolutely. Covered in children. We had eight children staying over the weekend. Eight Blimey. children. Yep. Blimey. Not all my own. <laughs> I love how you probably goes to without saying. That one there. Goes without saying. <laughs> right, well, there's there's an awful lot to get into, uh, but I want to try something different for the start this week. I want us to Excellent. do our one word race Ooh. reviews. Okay, impossible. so I have okay. briefed you because otherwise this would that's you know. impossible. You have for me, briefed Matt. us. Yeah. I mean, why would you let that? I mean, we want to sort of spontaneous and straight off the bat. Yeah. Okay, fine. What's your one word you. then? Bullish. Bullish. Like it. Yeah. I'm going bullish because I feel there is a sense of authority growing in the paddock with Red Bull. They, they're they owning it this season. But I also sense maybe an air of foreboding about the relationship between Checo and Max. And both of them are trying to assert themselves over one another. Just one point separating them in the jump. I love yeah. that. Matt. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, ch I am gonna change my word. Oh, because I was gonna go for expected, because the result was exactly what I expected: Perez to beat uh, Verstappen right. to beat Alonso. But I'm gonna go swan-like. Because <laughs> the legs are going word. like the clappers under the water. Because, because you think it's serene at, at Red Bull at the moment, and I think under the water there's a lot of legs kicking, mm. and I'm not quite sure everything is exactly how Christian Horner would like it and how the team would like it for a smooth uh, domination. They are dominating mm. Formula One on the track at the moment, but they came very close to not having that one-two in Bahrain. They had issues in the race yesterday. Mm. I think if you look in the cool-down room after the race, there is still friction between the two drivers, and Checo was not a happy man mm. uh, being asked to do target lap times that were slower mm. uh, than his... Um, than his teammate. And as for his teammate's dad, all is clearly not well in Jos Verstappen's mind when his son finishes second, leads the world championship, uh, and he can barely break a smile. But being I mean, what was front going and centre, you know, not rather than taking a step back, he, you know, yeah. he was front and centre. He, he knew the cameras mm -hmm. were going to be right there. And he looked quite grumpy, didn't he? He looked very grumpy, <laughs> twice, as did Max's manager, Raymond, as well. Mm. It's like, so if they're listening to the podcast, guys, come on, smile. Crack a smile. You know, for heaven's sake, you're, you're about half a postcode clear of the rest of the field. It could be worse. Mm. And, and when you think about how impressive that recovery drive was from Max, now he said, albeit through gritted teeth, that he was delighted to have secured a P2. That's what he was aiming for. But the dominance with which he did that, had he not been starting P15, and perhaps slightly unnerved by those drive shaft issues, mm -hmm. he could have won the race. Mm. But I just do predict, and I think we're actually agreeing with each other, that 
Christian's going to have his work cut out to manage those two this year. Yeah, mm. I, I think I think technically it's worth bear, pointing out transmission it is the problem uh, for Red Bull. Um, maybe a bit of overheating uh, yeah. at times as, as well. Um, but as I say, Bahrain and you know more audibly uh, in terms of the drivers' concerns, Saudi. Th th there are concerns there. Um, but it it is often us with an Adrian Newey inspired car, and it's not just Adrian, of course, that's designed this car. But it's all you know. Let's go for maximum performance, and sometimes they're a little bit fragile uh, in that respect. So reliability could be a key. It is to a lot of other teams at the moment as well. Um, that fractious nature between Perez and Verstappen, and Perez is in the last year of his uh, of his deal at Red Bull. So, if there's no signs of another deal coming, you know what's in it for Sergio to start helping his teammate in the way that uh, Red Bull would quite like. But they have got a, a huge amount of pace. They've done a superb job uh, with this car, which should be applauded. And, and not seen as a negative. Absolutely, yeah. You know, we, we, we all applauded, you know, McLaren back in the day when Prost and Senna were, were, mm. were winning everything. We should, And we applauded Mercedes for the job they did at the start of the turbo hybrid era. We should applaud Red Bull for, for, for this too because uh, excellence is what we want to see mm. in, in sport. But, um, yeah, I, I think there are, a, there are a few banana skins down the road. I think it was the radio so, message that was mm. quite telling. Checo asking, you know, where is Max? How far away is Max? And what was it? He he said four point... He, yeah, he was doing one, one thirty. Th 32, six yeah. plus four. Um, yeah, basically, Ma <laughs> Max, Max was there, safe in the knowledge that he could put that fastest lap in on the last lap and Checo mm. wouldn't be able to respond. And he'd saved everything up for that because he knew with four laps to go, there was no way he was going to catch his teammate. And look, he got a bit lucky in the race. The safety car helped him uh, yesterday because he hadn't pitted um, at that stage when it came out. But, you know, you need a bit of luck to slice your way through the field from, from 15th. And it was it was, a, it was a super drive. Once he once he got going and realised that the, the Red Bull was a difficult car to handle in traffic and he was going to have to put up with a bit of understeer. Uh, from time to time, um, but <laughs> when you're when you're alone in the cockpit, and we we don't know this, that's because we're not racing drivers. But you know, you can you can empathise with the paranoia that must go on mm. in Checo's brain, where he's had this perfect weekend, but he knows that at some stage his teammate is is going to be scheming to get as much out of it as he possibly can, because that's what Max does, and that's what any racing driver does. Mm. We haven't heard Matt's word yet. Go on. I'm pretty proud of this one, but I can't take credit for it oh. because it's from Twitter. <laughs> it's from so Mr. Bridger. Is what uh, yeah, well, I'm going to credit Mr. Bridger on Twitter. FIA Asco. Fiasco. No. Oh. You mean FIA Sco. FIA Sco, yeah. Fiasco. Yeah, Fiasco, which I think leads us quite nicely into our well, next. It's clever. Next couple. It's very clever. Well, don't. It's Matt's not hasn't been clever. I nicked it. Well, nicked it off Twitter. So who, who did you who did you get that from? Mr. Then? Bridger. Mr. Bridger. Mr. Bridger. Well, Mr. Bridger. <laughs> from the Italian job. <laughs> <laughs> Noel Coward striding down the stairs. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, maybe next week I'll try and get an original one. <laughs> I wouldn't, Matt. No, I like it, I like it. I like no, it. If it's good, plagiarise it. Highest uh, form of flattery and all that. There we go, exactly. Right, so, fiasco, Alonso. Oh. I think what would be sensible would be to try and explain this chronologically. Mm. Yes, go Crofty, for it. I don't know oh, if you... Right. Well, you, you, were, you were there. I can try, <laughs> I I can, there, so I'll I can try. try and explain it in terms of timing. Okay. But, so, I, but I think that's quite, that's quite key. I'll, I'll do my best on this one. So Are for, we allowed to interject between each? Yes, please do. Yeah. Okay. Please do. So, Fernando puts his car on the grid. And he is quite significantly um, out of position. Okay, so here's my first question. I love this. We Why got, we got, we got the sentence more? in. Why doesn't it happen more? Mm. You know, this is the most technologically advanced sport in the world and it's been called into question with paint on the grid. Why doesn't that happen more? And surely there's a way of safeguarding against it. Yeah, they can and did last year extend the yellow line um, uh, from the side of the box because drivers were complaining about visibility. It's happened twice already this season. I think they might need to extend it a bit more. And the, the, the wheel brows, I think, are causing drivers uh, some issues on that one. Saying that, you know, <laughs> Fernando's parked his car. He's either done it by chance and he's made a mistake or he's trying to get a little bit further down the inside to try and get past Sergio because he's got that inside and line going through. presume the, the latter, first surely. Well, it's, it's someone F1. of his Nothing experience. Nothing happens accidentally. Especially not with Fernando. I think the key question, though, is does he gain an advantage? Well, that, that's the thing. If he is, 
by being on the essentially on the left, because I guess well, he's a bit more down the inside. We're talking isn't he? centimeters, aren't we? Well, we're talking Every thousands of a second yeah. sometimes. Little Matt. matters. Look, yeah. it could it could be an absolute genuine mistake um, on this one. But if it is a mistake, they should guard against that because look at the ramifications yeah. of it. Look, the, um, as we'll get on to in a moment, there's a meeting of the Sporting Advisory Council on Thursday and I'm sure that sort of thing is, is going to be discussed between the, the sporting directors and the team managers and the FIA. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard and fast rule, isn't it? You've got to be within your pit box and he wasn't. Mm. So therefore, it's a, it's a slam dunk, five second penalty on that one. But that isn't the issue. The issue here is that he came in to serve his penalty and uh, this was what, lap 18? From uh, from memory, and the rear jack man pushed the rear jack in and touched the car. Now, it is easier to touch the car with a rear jack this year because the ride, the uh, the rear ride height is lower, certainly on that Aston Martin, and it's not as easy to get the jack underneath without touching the car. Now, you can argue to the cows come home. Does that give you an advantage or not if you're touching it? But in a sport where thousandths of a second. Mm. Uh, are often uh, the difference between success and failure, um, to be as close as possible in position to get going on the five seconds, because you can't work on the car until the five seconds is over, must be seen as an advantage. But the, the, the crux of the matter after that was, with the wording saying you can't work on the car, does touching the car constitute as working on the car? So we can have that debate now. What do you say, Nat? I mean, you would have to argue it's an advantage. But, and I don't want to sort of preempt what you're going to say later, they were able to prove there were seven other occasions when the front jack had touched and that yeah. wasn't deemed an advantage. I think, as a fan of the sport, I speak for other fans when I say you just want clarity and consistency. That That's the key. And you don't want to be finding out the result after the chequered flag. I know I'm jumping forward a bit here, but this is my, you know, I had the pleasure of watching back home, a house full of 25 people on Mothering Sunday, couldn't really <laughs> hear any of it. Um, <laughs> but it, it was so interesting to watch it and actually think, this isn't right. We can't have the decisions change. What other sport changes, that, unless you're being stripped of a, an Olympic medal, I, I can't think of other examples where the results changed after yeah. the well, end of the event. Well, well, so it, it, it happens in... We always compare things to football. The result might not change in football, but red cards get rescinded all mm. the time. I guess, though, it's with the football, result, though, isn't it, it? yeah, it doesn't affect the fundamental yeah. no, end of 90 minute result. But, but so I'll ask you this question what, what, what do you want? Do you want a sport that makes an instant decision that might be wrong? Or do you want. But the, it wasn't or, instant. It wasn't instant. That's our point, though, is it? it, it, it Alonso said you could have made that decision in the race. And I'd have had 37 laps to make up that difference. Right, let's they go. Made on, afterwards. Right, let's get on to the chron chronology. Okay, yeah, back to the <laughs> I can't even say. I told you I'd get over excited. <laughs> Chronological order. Lap, uh, lap 49, the last lap of the race. The race director asks the remote operations centre to have a look at it again. And this Why? is like VAR. Mm. Yeah, this is like yeah, the this VAR. Is a, this That's is a right. room full of screens in Geneva. Mm. Yeah. Well, the inference is, Nats, that somebody has alerted the race mm. director to there being a possibility that something was wrong who at Alonso's pit stop. Well, who would do that? Which, who, who would, who would gain an advantage? Yeah, who would benefit <laughs> at all from that? I, I'm, I'm not going to name names. There's, there's, there's names flying around all over the place. But, you know, the inference is another team would have alerted um, the race director to this. And... Whilst team principals can't talk to the race director, the, the, the sporting director, team manager uh, still can. Um, and don't forget the teams have a whole load of people back at base that are watching and scrutinising footage and looking for, you mm. know, possible misdemeanours that, that they can turn into, into their favour. So the argument, this could have been cleared up 20 laps previous, doesn't really wash with the timeline because the remote operations centre weren't looking at it, the race director wasn't looking at it, the stewards hadn't been asked to look at it, a everything had been done and dusted until it was brought up again by an outside okay, party. OK, but much like football, they were, you can refer to VAR, but it has to be instantly. Why isn't the same rule applied to Formula 1? But this is the... Yeah, why, this why, could you not, why can you not have a rule that says if it's not reported within yes. X amount of well, yeah, laps you, or X amount of time? Yeah. You, you, you do... Um, 
from my knowledge, I think you've got 30 laps and I think it came in right on the oh, 30 really? laps. Oh, really? Because, but you would do if you were another team wanting to um, wanting to get it re-examined. Mm. You're not going to give Aston Martin the chance to make up a 10 second yeah, gap. True. Yeah. I mean, oh God. Now, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously, we hear chatter on the radio, you know, from Mercedes and from Aston Martin about the possibility of this of this uh, five second penalty, and I. I said in commentary, well, it won't be five seconds, it'll be ten, because that's what Esteban Ocon got. Yep. And the Ocon thing was a completely separate. They did actually start taking the, the, the front wing off after 4.6 4. 4. 6 6 seconds. seconds so yeah. mm. so they, they, they did uh, uh, break the rules on that one. Um, so it, it was a pretty instantaneous decision as far as these things go, albeit it was done after the podium presentation. Fernando is on the podium, celebrating, massive grin, smile on his face, trophy in the air. The penalty comes. And he has the trophy wrenched off him. Yeah. I mean, imagine the scenes. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> who would also who would be the person to take it off him? Was I it George not. Russell? <laughs> only, <laughs> only if George Russell was still wearing his crash helmet, to be fair. I wouldn't want to be the person to, to wrench it from Fernando. The pity the fool. <laughs> what I was so impressed with, the fact that Aston Martin were able to draw upon seven examples of when the jack had touched the car in a pit stop previously. I mean, how do they even go about doing that in such a small period of time? Well, they'll build up a file of various instances um, at races. They'll go back you know, many, many years on this one, but I doubt they had to go back this far. Because so I'm literally sh- type into a search engine yeah, incidents it- where Jack touched... Yeah, well, we have we have stuff Archive. logged here at Sky yeah. all the time, don't yeah. we? We have a system where we can pull up um, things on the track and off the track, and 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 they will look at areas where they will need this cachet to use in defence should a problem ever arise. Um, teams, for instance, will, will practice pit stops serving a five second penalty during the course of a weekend they'll look at how many times on average they get a five second penalty and then they'll work out the percentage of how many times they need to practice it during the course of the weekend so they're always looking at whatever eventualities that need to be practiced or or taken into account for Um, but Andy Stevenson who is the sporting director at uh, Aston Martin basically your rules and regs man he sits Mm. on the pit wall very clever man very clever man comes from Northampton there you go says it all (laughs) Just like Nats, you see. They're, they're, <laughs> just to prove there's two people from Northampton that have excelled in their life here. Oh. Apologies to everyone from Northampton for that uh, one. Alan Carr and Graham Swan, because I was in a you list You can't once. deny it's a quite a good list. I'll tell Four you what, people yeah. out of the millions no, that no, have come from Northampton. Nats. I was listed as the third most famous person to come from Northampton. I'm like, I will take that <laughs> after Alan Carr and Graham Swan. Seriously, I'm the second best Formula One driver from Stephen. <laughs> 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 I don't know, I've had three laps, I'll take it. Anyway, back to Andy Stevenson, the fifth most famous person to come from <laughs> Northampton. Uh, so Andy is your rules and regs man, and he will basically be on the phone to the team back at their mission control at Silverstone to say, right, OK, I think we've got instances that we can call upon. I need this, this, this and this. Now, I did see Andy after the race. He was on the phone a lot. Uh, he was looking very stressed, but he, was, he has like an hour, an hour's time frame once a document is published uh, to decide what they're going to do. What I think happened was Aston Martin knew there was no appeal process because it was a time penalty and you can't appeal a time penalty. But they did ask for a right to review. And they're very different things. The right to review is where you go to the, to the FIA and to the stewards and you say, we've got new evidence that you didn't have when you made your decision. And because of that new evidence, we think you might want to change your mind because mm. we think we were in the right. You think we were in the wrong. But this new evidence might actually back up our case more than yours, rather than an appeal that just says, oh, you can't do that. That wasn't fair. Mm. You have to have new evidence for the stewards to to hear that review. My argument is that if touching the car is deemed to be working on the car or it's not, then that, why are there seven examples beforehand where it's happened and be let and we also because, don't it know how, pe- because it wasn't picked up at the time. But we don't know how long these examples go back. They could only go back to the middle of last season, yeah. for example. Is that, so it might, it might not be I a huge no bank of evidence. Yeah. But it's enough. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So enough to, um, I want to get into some fan questions decisions. here because there's understandably a lot of confusion amongst fans. Uh, and I think this kind of sums it up quite well. So this is from a tweet from Peace TV. Uh, do you think that the silly penalties and the time taken by the FIA to make decisions may turn off some of the newer fans. We've got a lot of new fans who've come to our no, sport. And mm -hmm. those are the, there are people at home who'll be watching this who might go to sleep Sunday evening, having had their Sunday dinner, going, oh, great, you know, Alonso is on the podium. That's when I, that's when the last thing I saw. They come in on Monday and they start reading Twitter and they see all this other stuff has blown up as well. Yeah, but the thing is, he's still on the podium. He's still coming. Yeah, he is now. Still came third. Yeah. The decision was still yeah. right. Look, I, I, I think you're right. If you don't understand all the nuances, it can be quite off-putting. But you can't you can't simplify everything all the time. No. In and life. that's why we love the sport, it's, let's be honest. It's sometimes things have to be done properly and processes have to be put in place. Now, what I would say on this is I do think the rule book and the sporting regulations are getting very complex mm. and, and the technical regulations too and are getting ever elongated. And Steve Nielsen, who's gone from... Uh, Formula One, Liberty, to the FIA as their sporting director. One of the things I think Steve's going to look at is how to simplify the rule book. But I'm just going to give you a little for instance here <laughs> from last night where, and I think your point, Nats, is, look, why doesn't the rules just say you can't touch the car, right? That's really simple. If you've got a penalty to serve in the pit lane, you can't touch the car. Yeah. So I put this to a couple of leading team members at a Formula One team. I went, right, Thursday, Sporting Advisory Council, you're going to get together, the rules are going to be rewritten. Well, I wouldn't say, wouldn't say that, Crofty. Well, why not? Well, it's very technical. It's very complicated. I said, no, it's not. Just make sure you can't touch the car. Well, you can't have that. I said, well, why can't you have that? Well, what about the front jack? I said, well, what about the front jack? Well, if the, if, if the driver comes in and he breaks a bit too late, he doesn't stop on his marks and he hits the front jack, we're going to get a bigger penalty. I said, well, yeah, fine. I mean, the front, jack, doing it. the front jack doesn't need to be there. Mm. It's not a fast pit stop. Mm. You've got five seconds where the get car in there, stopped yeah. to yeah, get yeah, in yeah. there. But the teams will find reasons why it's not very simple. Mm. So maybe, I'm going to suggest this right now, it is time to think once again about how much involvement the teams have in shaping the rules and regulations <laughs> of Formula One. Because I think one of the cruxes to this argument, and maybe one of the big problems is that the teams have too much influence a very good on point. the rules and regulations. And in no other sport, really, do the competitors have that much influence. Mm. So if we want to simplify things and we want to make it easier to understand and not have quite fan so many rules palatable. and regs for the future... So fan palatable, I like this one. <laughs> That's good. Yeah? If we want to focus on the fans, and, and, and we should be doing, helping the fans get the most enjoyment out of the sport that we all love, then maybe take the team's influence away. One point I'd like to make is the fact that this sport does have so many subplots does make it compelling. And the, 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 the marginal gains and the minuscule room for error is part of the reason that we watch it. Mm. And so the fact that the, the rear jack touched the car was enough to scupper a podium actually is fascinating because you don't get that in any other sport. I mean, how much time is that? saving that's like 0 0.3 0 0.4 I mean, seconds but if you add that onto excellent. a pit stop yeah. that is the kind of time difference we're talking yeah. about of being a good pit stop to a poor pit stop right? exactly I mean, look, these, and it the, keeps us on the edge of our seat and yeah. these pit stops are always yeah. going to be quite slow when you're serving a penalty anyway because the car's stationary and everyone's waiting and then they have to you know get yeah. in there with a the wheel gun normally the, losing the, the car's moving and yeah. the wheel gun's yeah. attached yeah, yeah. that's how they get the, they, they get it done so fast um, maybe maybe there's an episode in Drive to Survive where actually we could stop going around Christian Horner's house and maybe we could go to the FIA stewards' room and we could actually look uh, at, at detail, simplified detail of the sport to help people understand. I personally love seeing Jerry on her horse. I want to get on to other sports and their governance and their rules because I think it's fair to say F1 has had some issues with rules and governance, certainly since Abu Dhabi 21 and I'm sure before that, but also... You know, more recently, I think in F1, we are going through a bit of a process at the moment of just learning and, and, and developing those rules. But if you look at other sports, rugby, for example, this weekend, Freddie Stewart's red card in the England Island game. You know, a lot of ex-pros are saying that is absolutely outrageous. That's not how the game is played. You then look at football, Crofty. I'm sure I don't need to reel off 
some West Ham VAR moments Please from don't. the past season. The guy's might, traumatised enough by his flight, so don't think of any audience I've gone a whole half an hour without thinking about yeah, David Moyes. Right, right, right. Thanks, yes, yes. But, thanks but, Matt. But, but look, no, I mean, it, it is, yeah, you can't deny that other sports are having the same issues as well. Well, I think we do need to remember we're in the entertainment industry. Fans pay a lot of money to watch it. And yes, OK, we want to maintain our credibility and integrity throughout. But it is important to know what affects the fans and their understanding of the sport. Now, I married into a Welsh family who are deeply passionate about their rugby, and as much as it pained my father-in-law to tell me, he believed England would have won that game had it not been for the red card. So that red card changed the direction of everything. Mm. It also made it incredibly complicated because even if ex-professionals can't explain it, what chance have the fans got? And I think we need to be very careful about being too technical with Formula One, because yes, it's one of the compelling elements of our sport that draws people in. It's nuanced, it's layered, it's got countless subplots, but you have to be able to take those bite-sized elements and have them explained, which is why it's great to have Crofty in the comms box. My husband has always played and loved rugby. He's over it. He says it's way too technical. And if you take out the physicality by red carding someone like Freddie, then what's the sport got? And I think we have to learn lessons from that. Always draw upon parallels with other sports and, and learn potentially from their mistakes. Mm. We are in the entertainment business and Formula One has, has done very well to, to make that quite a key focal part of, of, of its mission statement going forward. But we're not WWE. You know, we're, 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 not, we're not about trying to engineer results just to make it a spectacle. Well, unless you're Bernie and you bring in fake rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was his idea, wasn't it? Sprinklers by the side of the yeah. track, which wasn't a stupid idea, to be fair, because, as we know, when it gets wet, it gets exciting. But you do have to main credibility yeah. and the integrity of the sport. Well, I do accept. You, 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 you absolutely do. I, it has got complicated. The technical regs are very complicated. Are we at a stage now with Formula One where the best thing to do is to say, right, we're going to police your accounts, yeah? We, we are going to absolutely police your accounts like there's no, like you've never seen before. You've got $200 million a year. Go and do what you want. That's, that is your budget. Because mm. at the moment, the budget cap's uh, $140 million, something like that. Um, but the top three earners and the driver's salaries aren't, part of that marketing isn't part of that blah 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 here's 200 million dollars do what you want mm. to design your Ooh, car that's a very exciting that. prospect isn't it <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> cool, well, knock yourself out buy you yourself something free <laughs> but, but the thing is does that then does that then satisfy the, the huge amount of fans who have been with Formula 1 for many many years who like the complexities like the technical nuances you know a, a, a deeply involved and, and, and have invested, uh, invested their passion and uh, whilst at the same time not alienating any of the new fans yeah. that have come in you know during the what should, should we call it the drive to survive era yep I you know we which i think you know has has brought we know that because whenever, whenever we have conversations you know with people who are new to the sport yeah well, i've been watching drive to survive it's been brilliant you know mm. ultimately we've, we've had this discussion was the right decision made yes with alonso Yes, and I think even George Russell accepts that. Yeah. I mean, he said it even before yeah. he was given... Well, when he was given the trophy, he said, I sort of feel a bit guilty for taking this. Mm. Because also, I guess, as drivers, you know that if the rules are being applied to Fernando, the next week, Absolutely. you're going to be subject to them as well. And, and, and I do hope that on Thursday of this week, as we record this on a Monday, the rules are rewritten to say you can't touch the car. Mm. And however, some teams might you know, think that's not a very good idea. It is a much clearer way. Don't touch the car. And then at the end of five seconds, you know, when the stopwatch says five or, or your, your team manager's counted to five, however the teams do it. One they, banana, two well, banana, three. Some teams, How some teams do, do they that. count? No, but some teams do that. One Mississippi, that's longer Yeah. than one banana. Yeah, that's, but, bu that's building in a buffer, so it's okay. I mean, genuinely, how do teams count well, their five seconds? Well, some do. They really, they count. Some, some do a verbal count, some do a stopwatch. And is it being checked by the FIA? Yeah, the FIA, the FIA will have their, their own stopwatch on it. I do it when the kids are naughty. I'll go, I'm going to give you five seconds, <laughs> four. We do hang about quite a long time on three. Yeah, so you're too patient. Two and a half. <laughs> Not sure that would work in four. No. One. 
You can imagine the race director coming down on the radio doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be oh, fun. Um, but yeah, so so just rewrite it so that no one touches the car. Yeah? yeah, everyone's in the same boat. They can all hover millimeters away, and then get to work. And get I wonder out. as well if you. I don't know how you actually enforce no one touching the car. You know, like the mm. game operation. If you just, just thinking, you know, do you have to like that, yeah. put some sensors on the car? You get electrocuted. You get electrocuted to touch if it goes okay, back. So I'll go That'll back. Stop. So put some sensors on the car. That's logical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah but sensors of weight. They're of too heavy. And that's extra weight. Of and the teams don't want extra weight. See and how complicated the rules. The teams. See how complicated it gets. Yeah. Well, teams and the FIA. Together. Very good. All right. Well, look, I think we can agree the right decision was reached, even if it took four, three, four hours, it, five it, hours. It took, it took a bit. <laughs> it took be a bit. But I, I, I go back to I want to see the right decision being made, not quick, snappy decisions that could be, still be wrong. I want to get into some fan questions now because we put out a little post. Thank you for your comments uh, on Twitter and Instagram about the race and to get your thoughts on it. So Alex on Instagram wants to know... We're going to completely change tact here from Alonso and and Aston Martin. Can Red Bull win 100% of the races in 2023? Can they? Yes. Will they? No. Because I think reliability will come into play. Yeah. I mean, they had three DNFs in the first three races last year. But as we've talked about already, they've had some close calls in the last Mm. two races. No car is bulletproof. 23 races is a big ask. Mm. To win every single I'm race. I'm going to have a couple of crofty DNFs if we're not careful. If you bring him into this podcast without any kip again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. I'll, I'll pack my sleeping bag next time. Yeah. Yeah. DNS did not sleep. <laughs> did not sleep. <laughs> um, no, no they, they won't. But the other thing, of course, is that as the season goes on, they get less wind tunnel CFD time mm. than, than certainly Aston Martin. This is the, the fact that we've got an Aston Martin Red Bull battle at the moment is brilliant because Aston Martin, under the wind tunnel, and CFD restrictions get 100% of the time because they finished seventh in the Constructors' Championship last year. Red Bull get 70% of the time, but because they were naughty boys and girls and overspending on the cost cap, reduced by another 10%. So they only get 63%. So Aston Martin had 37% more wind tunnel CFD time. That equates to about 120 wind tunnel runs in the, in the course of an eight-week period. That's a and lot. And how long yeah. is a wind tunnel run? Well, it's kind of every time it's it's turned every, on. Right, right, right. Yeah, but how long does that last? Sweet. How long does well, it can, one last? It can, it can last as long as it wants. Now it's, it's it's the bit from turning it on to turning it off when you've gathered the data. Oh, I see. Because yeah. obviously, as, as far as I know, I am not yeah. a wind tunnel expert. <laughs> oh, you sounded pretty good to me. Yeah, just take a deep breath and go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think conclusively then we can say that we don't think Red Bull are going to win every race this year. I think we certainly probably, in the interests of the sport, hope they don't. I think it'd be great to see some other people win uh, this year. And I certainly think fans would, would say that too. But you know what? If they do win every single what an race, achi- though, I mean, what an achievement. What a brilliant yeah, achievement. And yeah. we should celebrate that. I agree. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not into variety for variety's sake. I yeah. want competition out there. But if one team have excelled... Yeah. But I go back to our original point, whereby the battle will not be with others. It will be internally. Okay, that brings me on to my next question. Clark on Instagram. Why didn't Max park his car in the second position at the end of the race? Anyone else would have got a penalty. He parked it on the... Wait, where did he, he park it? the pit lane, didn't Yeah, he? just didn't put it on the... By where the one, two, three car positions are. Clark, I'll take you back to Monaco, 2009. And the shot of Jensen Button running down the main straight. Because he parked his brawn car after winning in the pit lane and forgotten that he was meant to park it on the grid in front of the Royal Box. <laughs> so Clark, stop looking for conspiracy theories here. <laughs> Anyone else would get a penalty. Uh, I would imagine Max just brought it into where he normally brings it in and had forgotten and wasn't told that he was meant to park it on Do the grid. Do you think? No. Really? Yes. Do you think? But I mean, Max is quite used to winning Formula One races. Yeah, but how he knows often... where to park. If, if, yeah. you know, fair enough if it's your where first he, race. And also, park... Jensen would have been overwhelmed with emotion having won the Monaco Grand Prix. Did, okay. He can be forgiven for forgetting. Where did Max park his car in Bahrain? I've no idea, and this on, is why I don't the, think he... on, on the, the ramp the, yeah. under the podium in Park Ferme. Where do cars normally pull into at the end of a race? Park Ferme. Yeah. They don't normally go on the grid. Oh, I see. So it's a bit, it, it, it's not a one off. No, no, no. Okay, it well, does yeah. happen with that. all the time. Final question from the fans. Uh, Jack on Twitter, should Ferrari be worried with their lack of pace? Yes. I think yes. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe when we looked at the 
Drivers' Championship that Charles has six yeah. points. Unthinkable. Six. Well, he didn't finish the opening race first time in his career yeah. that he's not finished the opening race of the season. Um, I'm really sorry about this, Ferrari fans, uh, but I'm going to give you a little story from the way back oh dear, from Jeddah. Like yeah, well, I, well, I had a chat with someone from Ferrari and I said, did you turn your engines down in the second part of the race? Because you were okay in the first stint. You know, and Charles was coming through quite nicely. You know, the safety car caught you out a little bit because they pitted before the safety car. But did you turn your engines down after that? And they said, no. Oh, dear. Uh, to, so I went, ooh. And they went, Yes. So, so that is all that you say. That was their that was their pace on the hard yeah, tire, yeah. and that that is w where I would worry if I'm Ferrari at the moment. If they were turning the engines down for reliability, then you assume that reliability gets fixed. But if that was their pace at the end, at a track they thought they do well, okay. I don't get it. Well, it's, it's I think they were suffering tire wear. I think teams are finding out that actually it's not as easy to follow. The cars this year, as it was last year, they're going faster. There's a bit more downforce being created, a bit more turbulent air. Tire construction's different. It, it, things have changed a little bit in terms of how easy it is to follow. But Ferrari were suffering tire day, and, and that is their main... I'm going to say it again because it's my favourite gag of the year so far. Achilles wheel is tyre degradation. But it has been for so long. It begs the question why they haven't got on top of it. Well, I think they're trying. But and reliability as well, because well, if you look at tiring. the state of... The engines, yeah, I mean, you look at Charles, he's on another controlled electronic system as well. It's Yeah, that's, that's, that's one part. Yeah, and it's not looking good. Yeah. And, and we're only two races in. But while we're trying to demystify F1 a little bit, I did get a tweet last week to say, control electronics, how can Ferrari get penalised for that? Because it's all the same, isn't it? It's not. The control electronics refer to part of the power unit, which is spec to all teams or to all uh, power unit manufacturers. But there is an ECU that all the teams run um, that is standard and that collects all the data and basically makes sure that the FIA can monitor the car so that the teams aren't uh, cheating or doing anything they shouldn't. So don't confuse control electronics with, with ECU because some people were last week. Mm, fair enough. I think Ferrari, If yeah, if I was a Ferrari fan, I'd be a little bit worried. This should be their year. Yeah. You know, you felt. But I said that last year. A, I was just going to say you said it last year, year. and well, that's the. You would, yeah. It feels like they've taken a step back rather than gone forward. Well, I think Red Bull have taken a massive step forward. Yep. Aston Martin have taken a massive step forward, and Ferrari are somewhere mm. within the Aston Martin, Mercedes, Ferrari. They've battle. had a little shuffle forward, but not quite a full step. Mm. And uh, you know, you're only. You know, you may think that you have confidence in what you've achieved over the winter break. Well, it means nothing if everyone yeah. else has moved further ahead yeah. of you. Yeah. Look, Spichard finished seventh, and that was Ferrari's target, P5 to P7, for a man starting... Given his penalty. 12, given his yeah. penalty. The worry is that they just weren't making any impression in that final stage, and Carlos had a target of a podium, and they didn't look like they were going to get that. Yeah, and when you see how Max carved his way through the field to finish P2... See, there's another thing. This worries me a little bit because going into that race yesterday, talking to the people that we, we do in the paddock before a race, nobody was saying they're going to fight Max if he comes up behind them. Because yeah. everyone's saying, well, they're, they're not our race. Red Bull aren't our race at the moment. We're, we're not going to make it easy for him, but we're not going to lose too much time holding him up and ruining our own race. Mm. That does worry me a little bit because the whole point... Of cost cap, and then the wind tunnel and the CFD restrictions as well, was to close up the competition mm. so that you weren't going to get a team blasting by as Max did with Lewis. And I said, like an F2 car uh, trying to defend against an F1 it, car. It, you at least want to see some kind of fight, don't you? Yeah. Just seeing a car breeze past another car. There was, is there, was no, there was no yeah. fighting. I mean, Lewis almost that, moved out the way. Imagine it how it feels for like the it. driver that yeah. hasn't defended. Yeah. Goodness me. If you're dispirited. <laughs> yeah, <I'll do. laughs> imagine how they feel. <laughs> uh, dispirited, yes, I can imagine. Right, I think that's that's all we've got time for. Really? Oh, I was yeah. only just getting going. Where were you? <laughs> that was what's worrying him. I think we're going to send like, you off to, okay, a, to a long sleep. Let's yeah. get him to bed. Yeah, go to sleep, go home. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. It's Walk been me lovely. from the car if you like, if you want to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you know what? <laughs> I've got a car waiting for me. I will be asleep within about. 
20 seconds. I, I, the, the, the best thing in a, able to cope with what we do for a living is to, is to learn the ability to sleep wherever, Anywhere. at any stage. Planes, trains and automobiles. Uh, if, if ever do you remember when I fell asleep standing up on the... Yes. Travelator. Yes. The airport. <laughs> I actually did. I was standing up and I felt... Crawford went, oh, oh, we've got a fall out. <laughs> he literally caught me. She's great at that sort of thing. It's staying asleep. That's your problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, I honestly... <laughs> if ever I'm not driving, I will sleep in a car. <laughs> I sleep on a train. I, I get on at Milton Keynes and my body clock wakes me up just as we're pulling into Euston. <laughs> How it happens, I really do not know. <laughs> the marvels. But I've developed that one and planes, yeah, I'm asleep before takeoff. Unless there's a baby sitting next to him. Unless there's a baby. <laughs> Which was well, hilarious. it wasn't a baby, it was, it was a, there, there was a very loud child on the flight. <laughs> Called Simon Lazenby. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> we will end it there. Uh, thank you very much for your company. We will be back next Tuesday to look ahead to the Australian Grand Prix. We will see you then. 